Good morning, everybody. My name is Robert Austin from the Center for European, Russian, Eurasian Studies here at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. I'm delighted today that I'm going to be having a conversation with not someone who's just a, a, a terrific analyst, a terrific writer, but also a terrific friend. And uh, it's a real pleasure to invite Ivan Krastev here. So Ivan, as I said, you know, we have a bit of history together and uh, I thought we'd take a trip down memory lane, so to speak and talk about some good things and some unfortunate things that have happened over the past uh, couple of decades. We met originally as, uh, as two younger analysts uh, after the Kosovo War. So that was 99. There was a bit of optimism then, uh, and something called the Stability Pact for Southeastern Europe was set up, and that's where we found each other working uh, and trying to come up with some strategies for the integration of what became known as the Western Balkans. And, you know, when I first met you, you were a Balkan specialist, and I relied on your expertise on a, a huge number of occasions. And as I said, we seemed optimistic then about the trajectory of, of the Balkans in 99, 2000, maybe 2001. And I want to think, get you to think big picture. What went wrong in the Balkans and what went right? Listen, it's great that you're going back to the 1999, because 1999 is more important than people now try to imagine. Uh, when people talk about the birth of uh, the post-Cold War liberal order, they always talk about 1989, about 1991. This is not the whole truth. First of all, 1989 came to such a surprise to everybody, both East and West, that the general feeling in the early 1990s was not triumphalism. The general feeling was anxiety and uncertainty. Just look at the most popular books of the time. Uh, people remember, of course, Frank Fukuyama's The End of History, but paradoxically, The End of History was written before the Soviet Union collapsed. And if you read basically the famous article that Frank did, it was not meant that Soviet Union was going to collapse. The books that came out of the collapse of the Soviet Union was Brzezinski's Out of Control. It was basically Huntington's, the clash of civilization. So there was a lot of anxiety. It was not triumphalism. And if you see the first Western response to the Yugoslav Wars, the first big war in Europe after the World War II, it was very much about how to get to peace and not how to establish a new order. If you look at Dayton, Dayton was meant to stop the war. It was not more than this. It was the Kosovo operation that is the real birthplace of the post-Cold War liberal order in the way we talk about it in Europe, for several reasons. First of all, it was very much about the primacy of the individual rights over the state sovereignty. It was very much about the rights of the minorities, which was very critical for this liberal order. Certainly, it was also about the new role of NATO and the West as the guardian of these uh, rights. But what was critically important from the Western perspective, this was the war that was not driven by a geopolitical interest, but by the ideas. What makes Kosovo different than Kuwait or anything else of this world is no oil, no natural resources, and secondly, what is very important, not people like us. You have the West going to defend basically the Muslim uh, minority in a faraway country, and this is why the normative foundations of the liberal order was put there. And this is why the Balkans looked very important. And the story was, we don't know when, but we know what is going to happen to the Balkans and that the Balkans are going to join the European Union. And this was kind of the major promise and it came very much official during the Thessaloniki meeting in 2003. What happened since then are three things. Our common friend Ramzi Lani, in my view, had the best definition of uh, what happened in this last 20 years. He said, in the Balkans, we moved from repressive regimes to depressive regimes. In a way, everything happened and nothing happened. There were elections, government has been changing, but the most important that has happened at the end of the day is that Balkan became the land of the frozen solutions. Well, in the former Soviet Union, all the talk was about frozen conflicts. In the Balkans, you have the frozen solution. Kosovo was independent, but five of the EU member states still were not recognizing it. Serbia has a free elections, but basically it, it doesn't uh, become a democracy, at least in the way people expect it after Milosevic fell in 2000. Uh, and uh, you, the most important thing that happened was that economic growth was quite an impressive, and the most important was the dramatic depopulation of the region. 
people were simply leaving their countries. So as a result of it, uh, after 20 years, it was demography, much more than democracy, that defines, defines how people feel. And it is just now, when the next big war comes, the war in Ukraine, that people understood that the Balkans should be viewed differently. Because before the idea is, here's the European Union, one day Balkan countries are going to join, here's the waiting room, and they can live in the waiting room. Uh, but now when uh, the war, uh, Russia invasion in Ukraine started, you basically discovered that the waiting room is the emergency room. And you cannot keep people in the emergency room forever. So from this point of view, for anybody who wants to know what happened since the end of the Cold War, this is two important things. When the Cold War basically uh, ended, the most kind of a well-positioned country in the days of the Cold War, Yugoslavia, was collapsed. Yugoslavia collapsed being the winner of the Cold War status quo. Yugoslav so much uh, basically loved the Cold War status quo that you cannot survive the end of the Cold War. In a certain way, what we see today is Ukraine was the country that was least integrated in the post-Cold War world. Uh, economically, it basically was, of course, uh, uh, performing much under its potential. It was totally torn apart uh, by uh, Russia uh, uh, and the West, and it was never really allowed to make choices of its own. So from this point of view, only when we compare the Yugoslav wars with the war in Ukraine, we are going to see first the nature the post-Cold War liberal order, everything positive and negative, but at the same time also to understand that something dramatically is ending these days and we're in a new world. The threat of the nation state, the resilience of the nation state. You know, maybe we were too optimistic in 89 that the nation state was dead and buried. I think that this is a huge blunder. But coming back to your political scientists, one in Belgrade or, or Skopje and the other one in Prague, uh, are you basically saying that the nation state, in the, even in the 19th century sense, the way identity you know, was linked to foreign policy, the way identity was embedded, so th is, is that something you see as the hallmark of the 21st century in the sense that we are revisiting a lot of issues uh, that we thought in some cases might be part of our past and now they're part of our, you know, our present and our future? Listen, we're not just back to the 19th century. And even when we talk about national identities, it's different. But this is one thing that people are in a certain way not realizing with respect to Europe. Europe was a classical post-national project. And if you see it basically, the history of Europe's role in a global politics, in before World War I, Europe was the world. The World War I is also known as the European War because it was the war of European empires. And then comes the Cold War. And during the Cold War, uh, European powers were not the most powerful, and neither the Soviet Union nor the uh, uh, United States have been a classical European powers, but Europe was the major theater of the conflict. The Cold War was about Berlin. And then comes the post-Cold War world, and this post-Cold War world, and particularly now, with a major contestation between China and the United States, Europe is not even the center stage. In a geopolitical terms, even if they're going to be in a Cold War, Europe is going to be in the position of Japan, American ally, but not uh, on the major theater uh, uh, of confrontation. But it was after the end of the Cold War that the European Union found a new role for itself, and this is a laboratory of the world to come. European Union believed that the things that are happening, for example, this postmodern, post-national state, this is the general trend that comes out of the economic interdependency, out of the globalization. And Europeans, we were not idiotic to believe that everybody is going to be like Europe, but we believe that the significance of the European Union is that we're experimenting with things that others are going to face, and this is why we have been important. What has happened in the last years, and of course now this is very strong, is first we understand that probably what we believe is our universalism was our exceptionalism that neither Africans, nor Indians, and so on, are as much interested in what we're doing. But secondly, that our own model and some of the major conditions on which it has been built has been dramatically questioned. Listen, Europe was based on the assumption that they are not going to be a major war on the old continent. 
we were based on the assumptions that military power doesn't matter. And now you have the German government, which decided to invest 100 billions in uh, defense capabilities. This is an identity change. You cannot imagine for Germany what it means. Secondly, people are talking a lot about Germany because of their commercial interests going with this Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2. No, for Germany it was a security project. They managed to convince themselves that they should treat Russia in the way they have been working with France. So the more you're buying gas from Russia, the less basically Russia is going to have incentives to fight you. And then you suddenly realize that what you believe is a source of security becomes a major source of vulnerability. And basically you're facing the Putin's winter of 2022-2023. This is a major change. And even the success of Ukraine which Europeans are totally admiring, even this is a challenge to the European project. Because the success of Ukraine is a classical success of a civic nationalism. This is, we can talk it differently, but you have a nation which till yesterday, both by Europeans, but even most of its own citizens, was perceived as dysfunctional and corrupt and so on, which was able, on the base of the mobilization uh, of the national sentiment, to resist the biggest army in Europe and to succeed. So from this point of view, we discover the power of nationalism, the power of societies that are ready to sacrifice. And this is the Europe as a post-sacrifice society, where you do not have the legitimacy to ask your citizens to sacrifice in, uh, for anything. This is what is as a challenge. So as a result of it, regardless of how and the war is going to end up, European Union is going to be remade as a result of this war, no less than Ukraine or Russia. We talked a little bit before about the notion of the post-sacrifice society, because I was mentioning, I said, I'm not sure that Canadians are prepared to make some of the sacrifices necessary, because Ukraine's war is very much our war. And if Ukraine loses, we all lose dramatically, and I'm not sure that everybody gets that. And I think that that's a very important aspect of what's going on. But I want to come back then because, you know, thing, you know thinking about wrapping up and, and you mentioned Putin. Of course, this is the most fundamental person in all our lives right now. We probably wouldn't have expected that, but that's the way it happened. Of someone from Dresden who ends up in power in, in 99 and then stays with us for 22 years. But I want to read you back a quote that, that was in the Financial Times. And as you know, I very much enjoy reading your comments in the Financial Times, the New York Times as well. And it's about this notion, the difference between democracy and autocracy. And uh, it'll bring us to Putin, you know, in the current situation. This is the cardinal difference between democracy and autocracy. Even weak democratic governments are able to preserve their legitimacy, whereas the legitimacy of the autocrat depends on how strong the public perceives them to be. And contrary to the claims of Kremlin propaganda, while most Russians are ready to cheer on their army, they are much less enthusiastic about joining up. This is the, the conversation based on the... Uh, on larger call up for the Russian army. So my question to you is how strong is Putin these days? Listen, uh, people, we have a good reasons to believe that his days are numbered, but we don't know the number. Uh, the problem is different. The problem is that in a certain way, and this is for me very important, Putin is quite aware of the weakness of his regime. And I'm going to give you one example. When the COVID uh, pandemic started, and by the way, Russia lost has one million excess deaths as a result of it. President Putin is very much obsessed with demography, so for him this is not irrelevant. But he was afraid to push for mandatory vaccination because he was going to face the same problem that the partial mobilization now faces. People not cooperating, people dragging their feet. So for him, it was very important to show the symbolic power of the Russian state but the power of the state is also the capacity to cooperate between the institutions and the citizens. And this is not there. The biggest failure of Russia in this war is that for the Ukrainians, this is a great patriotic war. And they're fighting it as a great patriotic war. They volunteer, they go. For the Russians, he created a nation of fans. Most of the Russians probably were going to be happy if the army is going to get Kiev. They are not interested to fight. This is not their war. And this is very important. And this is what is going to come as a result of it. The authoritarian states create the illusion of cohesion and the illusion of power. And one of the things that really worries me in this 
situation and this is why in a way I believe that situation in many respects is more dangerous than the Cold War because the clash between the Americans and the Soviets was the clash between two optimists. Both sides, Soviets for wrong reasons, believe that history is on their side. If I believe that history is my side, I don't want to kill you today, I'm going to wait for tomorrow because I'm going to be stronger. But Putin has an apocalyptic mind. He himself does not believe, neither in Russian nation, nor in his own political system. And this idea is that if I'm not going to act now, tomorrow I'm going to be in a weaker position, explains part of the escalation dynamics that we see. Uh, by the way, Ukrainians also have a tendency to escalate because they fear that they are going to be betrayed by the West. Don't forget, Yalta is a Ukrainian city. So from this point of view, we're in a situation where both sides psychologically are very much driven to escalation. Uh, and this is a very difficult situation. And of course, uh, President Putin is a symptomatic for this story in which the weakness of the states have been overdone. In the last 10 or 15 years, we're seeing just multinational companies becoming stronger here and there. But listen, the moment when the states decided to go back, all these multinationals that they believe that they're global citizens, they discovered their national passports. Uh, in a certain way, American big multinationals, believe me, in five or 10 years, they're not going to be able to operate in China. Uh, and even if we're not going to see a major ideological divide, we're going to see a major technological divide. Uh, and this is happening, and in my view, this is a world which, seen from outside, very much resembles uh, the world of yesterday, the Cold War world. On the other side, it is a very different one. And it is also a very different one because demographically the world has changed, economically the world has changed, the West relatively is much weaker than it was before. So all this is kind of this new world. And when President Putin made the statement that the next decade is going to be the most dangerous and unpredictable since the World War II, I don't believe it was a prediction. It was a promise. He promised to make it look like this. Yeah, that's, uh, his speeches have a tendency to you know, skew towards very ominous warnings and cat cat catastrophizing. Because he has an apocalyptic mind, but this is interesting about Putin, because he's coming from the intelligence community, we always uh, believe that he's very deceptive when he speaks. And what I have learned all these years, basically following him, that in a certain way he's a very sincere person. He says what he basically wants to do. Uh, and uh, it was enough to read his famous essay that Russians and Ukrainians are the same people, read, written by him personally and published in July last year to know what was going to happen later. So from this point of view, this is the interesting story. This is the difference between the prediction and promise. Uh, we can predict certain things, but we don't have the power to move it this way. If basically a leader of a nuclear power is saying that the next uh, decade is going to be the most dangerous, he also knows how to make it. How to make it so. Absolutely. I want, you know, just coming back to this, the COVID thing always amazed me how, how poorly Russia fared. And I very much enjoyed that piece you did in, in, the, in the IWM newsletter that we spoke about earlier. When you look at, I studied this to a degree because I was interested in yeah. why certain countries have higher death rates. And Canada did quite well, yeah. you know, all things considered. But when you look at COVID in the world, the worst place to be is post-communist space. Absolutely. In fact, your homeland, Bulgaria, yeah, yeah. I do believe had the highest uh, death rate. And I guess that comes back to one of the themes you've talked about in, in your previous work is that you, you cannot function in an environment when there's no trust. And the absence of trust explains Russia, it explains Bulgaria, it explains even Hungary, yeah. Czech Republic, you know, the, the total absence of trust. And how, but how does that feed into the, the, the notion of Putin as strongman when he's governing a country that is totally bereft of trust? Well, this is the problem. Listen, he's a not strong man. Uh, he's a man who should look strong because basically he believes that if he looks weak, his own country can collapse. But weaponization of mistrust is the most important thing that is happening. Uh, basically, President Putin managed to convince himself that West is in an irreversible decline. Uh, and listen, 
we should be also kind of understanding where he comes from. If you're meeting all these political leaders like Mr. Berlusconi and others, who are always ready to agree with you, to make a deal with you, if you're basically seeing uh, all these CEOs of big companies, which are ready basically to make compromises with anything that you're pushing for, you are going to be ready to believe that something is totally wrong with the West. And then there is a, just a cultural phenomenon. This is interesting to see to what extent basically Russian president speaks uh, the language of uh, uh, American cultural wars. So, for example, he compared himself with Russia to J.K. Rowling's, this being misunderstood. Listen, this is a Russian man of a certain generation who had one dramatic problem, and I find this is a dramatic problem in Russia based on European general, and this is the crisis of the parents' power. Basically, you have a generation of parents that cannot understand their own kids. And it's not about democracy. This is very much about social norms and social lives. And uh, President Putin is also totally, totally obsessed with the Russia's demographic decline. Three months before the war in Ukraine, on uh, several occasions, he was quoting the prediction of famous uh, Russian scientists from the 19th century, Mendeleev, that in the year 2000, there are going to be 500 million Russians in the world. And he said, that they are now they're only 150 million. Uh, and this idea that there is no enough Russians, so as a result of it, Ukrainians should be Russians, and Bell Russians should be Russians, and the kidnapping of the Ukrainian orphans and kids and the way they have been adopted in the Russian families. There was an amazing uh, uh, story being written by New York Times about this. We're talking about more than 200,000 cases. Special legislation change for fast adoption of Ukrainian kids shows you something. So this is what is, in my view, a very important point of this new identity politics in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, but particularly in the world in general, I mean particularly Western world. Don't forget, 19th century nationalism was the nationalism of a young and growing society. Uh, now, depopulation, loss of population, ethnic mixture, is something that is totally redefining uh, the way we see how the democratic politics goes. So, this kind of a shared apocalyptic views where on the left you have a lot of young people who basically claim, in my view rightly, that if we are not going to change our, our environmental policies, probably they are not going to be life on earth. And then on the right, you have all these people who said that if we're not going to change our cultural policies, they're not going to be our, our way of life on earth. These both of them see future as a threat. And in my view, this is what has happened dramatically. Suddenly, we lost the idea of the future. During the Cold War, both sides believed that future belongs to them. But both communist identity and liberal identity during the Cold War were anchored in the future. Now, for us, the future is just readjusting to the past. This is why all these reparation policies and so on are becoming so critically important. And I really miss this future dimension. Because the future, which is going to be different than the present, but this is going to be better, and it is going to be better for all of us, in my view, is something that uh, I'm missing. And this is probably why uh, all the crisis is now very much kind of lived as catastrophe. And the other story is history, because you're a historian, you know it better than me. We have also lost the idea of a common history. There was a period in which there, everybody knew the history of the Roman Empire. Before World War I, if you're an educated person, you always can make a reference and people know. And after that, at least we knew our national histories. But now, it is only certain anniversaries that are giving us the idea of a common history. I was asking myself the following, to what extent the Western response uh, to the Russia's annexation of Crimea was not very much predetermined that it happened in 2014. Just on the 100th anniversaries of the World War I, where everybody was reading the sleepwalkers. What was going to happen if this same act was going to take place in 2038, when everybody was going to read about the Munich? <laughs> uh, and I believe this is also the story. We do not have a consistent history. We, as Tony Judd used to say, we're not interested in history anymore. We're just interested in the lessons of history. But the lessons of history is not history. <laughs>
This is very true, and I'm, I'm very glad you reminded us of, of the late Tony Judd, you know, a, a tremendous scholar, uh, and still using his books post-war especially yeah. for, for instruction. That's it's an yeah. extraordinary writer and, and analyst. Let me just give you one last question, because this is part of what you're just talking about. I have a bunch of other questions about COVID particularly, but we can talk about that another time. What are you working on now? Is it, is it bringing all these things together? Yeah. Because book, a book is ahead, I assume. Yeah, the book is ahead. We're working with Stephen Holmes on a book project, and in a certain way, there are two projects that parallelly I work. One is a small book on exactly this, the politics of depopulation. Uh, and being Bulgarian, you should know one of the important things that is happening in Eastern Europe was exactly this loss of population. Part of it of uh, uh, aging and not particularly high birth rates, but also, of course, out-migration. Every month, a village is dying in Bulgaria. And it is not much different in the Baltics or Central Asia. How this is shaping politics? I was trying to imagine a society, and basically something interesting is happening within the European Union. People can move, they can work in other places, uh, but they're still going to vote in their own countries. Uh, there is no pressure, basically, to have a voting rights where you're working. So imagine that probably in 15 years, Bulgaria is going to look like this. 20% of the people on the labor market we're not going to have a voting rights. They're going to vote in some other places. 40% of the voters are going to be on the retirement age. And probably 10 or 15% of the voters are going to live outside of the country, so they're going to have the right to vote, but they're not going to pay taxes. So how our idea of relations between tax paying and political participation. How a democratic political community like this is going to function? What kind of issues you can decide with this structure of the vote? So this type of questions are very important for me because uh, uh, in 1953, uh, during the anti-communist uh, uh, riots in East Berlin, German uh, poet Bertolt Brecht uh, had this famous line in uh, his poem in which he said, if the government is so disappointed by the people, probably they should elect a new people. And strangely enough, we're living in a moment in which governments really can elect people. They can decide it by broadening or narrowing uh, the voting rights, by changing rules. And one of my major arguments is that the major difference between liberalism and illiberalism is what kind of people your government wants to elect. To what extent you try to keep the political rights just for the major ethnic groups, for example. In Bulgaria, we're opening the labor market, but we're not giving uh, political citizenships. Or to what extent you're trying to move for kind of a much more open and inclusive uh, 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 political community with also all the risks coming with this, because this can be also a major cultural makeup. So this is, this is one thing that interests me. And then with Stephen Holmes, we're very much working on this. What the rise of global Id poli of identity politics on the global level means. And this is also our working title because we, like everybody these days, we were quick to sign the contracts, uh, even for the translation before the book was written, was this idea of the international order as a whole of broken mirrors, where basically you're acting to try to force others to view you in the way you're viewing yourself. And where the most powerful also wanted to be viewed as more vulnerable and as the biggest victim. Well, I've got to tell you, I've never tired of that Breck quote, and I use it a lot in my own teaching, because it does tend to explain a lot, and I did get that quote originally from you probably two decades ago. Listen, Yvonne, uh, you know, I, I cannot thank you enough for joining us here in this in this conversation and interaction you've had a number of opportunities to meet with our students and i think that they'd get a lot out of that i am too with you on this demography thing i warn my students always you know guys it's one thing to get the history but you need the geography and the demography you know and the and, the, and there's something at work there and the demography you ignore at your peril uh, and by the way that gives canada a certain advantage because of the immigration system so i'll i'll end there thank you very much everybody that was Thank you for listening and uh, look forward to further conversations in the future.